Welcome to another episode of Threads of Enlightenment. It is always my pleasure and honor to welcome our guest. And I like to stop here for a minute. And I know you guys have heard me say this a million times, but I'll tell it a million more that I deem that they are presenting with several things very, very expensive because I've seen the, and understand the value of time. And I want to thank you, Susan, for coming and share some of that precious commodity time uh, here with us so that we can learn of you. The other is your journey. It housed who you were and it made you who you are. And we are privileged and honored that you're here to share that with us so that we can learn from you to become better human spirits while we occupy this beautiful rock that they call Earth, that we are here for a season. Thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Well, Ken, thank you for inviting me. I, I do have an unusual journey in some ways, but it's very typical in other ways. I am a retired physician. I practice neonatology, the care of sick infants, tiny premature and sick newborn infants in the neonatal intensive care unit for 34 years huh. actively. I love every minute of it, which is to say even those moments that were stressful, uh, emergencies, uh, challenging, ethically stimulating, <laughs> uh, tragic. I loved every moment of it and I missed it dearly since I retired. I wow. did not think I would miss it. I really was <laughs> quite done when I retired and, um, medicine had taken mostly everything out of me that I had to give. And I did have a lot to give. I've always been a person of high energy. <clears throat> I used to think I had a lot to prove, but mostly I had a lot to give. <laughs> and um, when I retired, I began a process of self-reflection that I then had time to do. <clears throat> and I thought about my life and I wrote a memoir. And so in writing a memoir, I went even further in self-analysis and appreciation of my journey than I had ever had time to um, complete while I was practicing. Um, I wasn't a regular old doctor in an office. I had a hospital-based practice. Mm. I ran to emergency delivery. I counseled expectant parents who were having twins or triplets six or eight weeks early. I ran back home to my own three children. I raised three children with my husband, who is also a physician, a pediatric nephrologist. He took care of children with kidney diseases. And between the two of us, we loved talking about medicine. Our children grew up hearing all about our stories from the hospital and the office and parents and sick kids. And they knew how much we cared and they knew why we were gone when we were gone. <clears throat> but I was gone a lot. And there were times throughout my uh, professional life that I um, may have felt like I wasn't a good enough mother because I worked so much. Um, I had an opportunity at the age of 41 to have a midlife crisis <laughs> and an episode of depression after the birth yeah. of my third child, which was one of the best things that ever happened in my life. And I can talk some more about that because there may be some middle-aged or younger mothers um, listening who might go, oh, that's me, that's me. <clears throat> and then uh, I recovered from that uh, with professional help. And then later in my life, at age 60, I had another opportunity 
for huge self-reflection when I became burned out. In the truest sense of the word, as physicians and nurses know burnout, I lost my compassion. I was physically and emotionally exhausted. I was working too much. All my kids were grown and out of the house. The baby was still in college. And um, I had reached a place because of a number of difficult cases where the parents and the physicians disagreed on what was best for their child and where um, children with terminal illnesses were languishing babies, not children, and um, where nurses and doctors disagreed about the best course. And there were several of those cases all at one time. And on top of my being exhausted and overworking, I detached myself from my patient unknowingly, probably unconsciously, to put some distance so that it wasn't so painful. Um, I was able to recognize that one little girl who had a terminal birth defect had been in our NICU for 14 months Hmm. and needed peritoneal dialysis. And she was never going to receive a kidney transplant because there was no room in her abdomen. She, She was born with a lot of abnormal, ab, excuse me, abnormal kidneys and bowel and bladder and pelvic area. So there was no way she could have a kidney transplant, but her nurses and doctors loved her so much. They recommended to her mother that she have peritoneal dialysis. And we did that, which was a temporary measure. It kept her alive. It made her comfortable. During that time, he went blind for reasons that no one understood. And, of course, her development as a baby, as an infant, was abnormal because she lived in a hospital. She lived in a neonatal intensive care unit. And that particular case was so troubling to me, perhaps because I was married to the physician who was instructed to give her peritoneal dialysis, and he and I both thought it was the wrong thing to do because it was only temporary. And in talking about that particular case and all of the ethical issues, he he just went along because that's what the most of the doctors and nurses wanted to do, and I kind of fought against it and in my mind and thought, well, that's not a solution. It's just prolonging things. And is he really comfortable? And is this the way a baby should live? And I decided with that particular case that um, the reason that the doctors and nurses were having so much trouble in deciding how much care to offer this baby 14 months old was because they had all fallen in love with her. Hmm. She was fun to be around and she loved to listen and she loved tactile things and the nurses adored her and they dressed her up in beautiful outfits. Her parents had since become divorced and her mother was, had another child at home who she rarely saw and because the mom was in and out of the hospital and also in the military, that particular case bothered me so much that I began to detach from my practice, from my peers, from her, because it was so painful to watch the situation. And I suppose other physicians might say, it might be equally as painful to watch a patient who's dying of cancer or to watch a teenager who's dying of an eating disorder. I mean, there are many things that we encounter in medicine that are painful to watch. But this particular baby was the one that tipped me over the edge. And 
And I became so burned out that I felt like I was no longer making a difference. It spilled over into all of my other care of all of my other babies. I remember rounding on a perfectly beautiful premature baby who was only three weeks old and said to the nurses, everything is perfect with this little boy. Everything is perfect. He's recovered from his lung disease. He's tolerating his mother's breast milk, his parents' visit. He has a beautiful family. And I heard myself saying, something is bound to go wrong. (laughs) And it was just such an abnormal thing to say about a child who was healthy and thriving that I said, what has become of me? I have just lost touch with who I am as a physician. I didn't think I was making any difference. And I no longer felt fulfilled as a physician. So I was 60 years old. It took me a long, long time to reach that degree of burnout. And when I was burned out, I was lucky enough to be in a practice where we were embarking on covering a low-risk labor and delivery setting. That is where normal mothers go to have (laughs) normal babies And everything's happy. And if you're high risk, you get sent to the big hospital. And this was a little hospital. And so I volunteered to go to work there. And I cut my hours back to 35 a week. That was part time for me. And I started to work on what had happened to my mind, my psyche, my spirit. How did I get so burned out? I... um had help from a therapist, a psychiatrist, because I wanted to examine the issues that had put me in this really dark spot. And for two years, I worked in that wonderful, happy nursery where everybody had happiness and healthy babies were born. And if there was a problem at the delivery, I was there and I could take care of it. And everything always turned out wonderful. And grandparents were around bringing balloons and siblings were visiting and new mothers wanted to talk about breastfeeding and safe sleep. And I just fell back in love with medicine. Susan, Dr. Landers, can I ask you a question? How how it is with this specific, you have actually changed the programming, how I do this interview. So I'm going to go with it. how again you mentioned a story where they came and they said this young this baby was healthy everything was right and then you made the statement as to yeah but something is going to go wrong mm-hmm. here you made that statement in that perspective you are it's with you and you are moved into this other arena whereby you're seeing quote unquote everything perfect did you bring that perspective or that um, thought pattern that you express with that young um, that child before when you said, did anything go wrong? Did you carry that with you or was that just one time? Um, no. Did it work Good question. You? It was always with me. You cannot be an intensive care physician without having a bit of pessimism or at least I couldn't. That may be because of the way I grew up. I want to go to that. I want to go to that because um, this is how I usually do this interview because I believe, Donk, that the formulation of you and I happens at that space. And what happens is I believe there were incidents that happened But based on our interpretation of those incidents, we make internal decisions that govern our lives, that resides there, hidden there sometimes. And it is um, such a part of us that we don't recognize it. It's there, but it's there. And what happens is usually as we get older, that thing will manifest and it will cause 
harm, whereas before it was protecting us. But later on in life, we see that there is no more use for that type of uh, belief. And the journey begins. How to the dance of disconnecting? How do I reprogram my mind as you, you, you know, being in that profession? You learn tools and so forth. Talk to us about your childhood, because I believe I tell people this is the first place by which we are residing. I call it the lab, Doc, so you'll appreciate that. Yeah. I call yeah. it a lab because we have our parents, our scientists working on from their thesis, whatever that thesis is that they acquired from their life. And now they're going to practice these things into us as they begin to embark on their journey with us along with them. Talk to us about your family unit. What was that like? So I said the comment, something's bound to go wrong. And that pessimism was so innate in me because I grew up in a family where my father was a rageaholic. He screamed and yelled and pit spit and he hit me and he slapped me and my siblings, but mostly me. He was a World War II veteran who was in the South Pacific. He survived, he was a medic. He survived two years in the latter part of World War II. And I learned much later that he had been, at age eight, abandoned by his mother, who was a Catholic, getting, trying to get a divorce from an abusive husband. Um, he was abandoned to the care of an aunt when he was eight. And his mother came back and got him and his little brother when he was 10. So he had abandonment by his mother in his childhood. He had severe trauma in World War II as a young man at age 18, 19, and 20. And he survived those things. And they were internalized poorly. And he externalized all of that trauma and rage on his children and his wow. wife. He did not hit or beat his wife, my mother, but she put up with all the raging and all the hitting and all the screaming. Um, so I was an abused child who never had a happy childhood. I had happy moments. I would mm -hmm. go outside and play. This was in the 50s. You know, everybody yeah. ran outside. We played in the yard, had a big neighborhood full of children. <clears throat> but but you never knew when daddy was going to lose it. And because of that, I grew up thinking something was wrong with me. Hmm. And that somehow I had caused his reaction. And it was way later in my 40s and 50s that I even discovered he had been abandoned as a child. I knew about the war and I, I knew that was a trauma, but I don't think I appreciated that until I was much older. Nevertheless, his reactions to his children and me and my mother standing by and allowing that to happen affected me in a way that I grew up trying to prove that I was okay, trying to be the best person I could possibly be because I didn't want it to be my fault that something went wrong. And so I think that children who are abused by their parents must, other children must feel that there's something wrong with them because that's what little children do if their parents are unhappy. Did I make mommy unhappy? Did I cause daddy to do this? And then they have to be okay with who they are and learn to love themselves for who they are. They become people pleasers, Doc. <laughs> they're, they're, okay, I'm a people pleaser. And a doctor <laughs> is the perfect people pleaser. Yeah. I can rush in and take care of people and I can yeah. give answers and I can provide medicines 
and I can spend so many hours answering questions and I can squeeze you into my schedule, even <laughs> if I need to go home to see my own children. I yeah. was a perfect people pleaser. Yeah. And But there was always that little nagging sense of, even though I'm a really great people pleaser, something's bound to go wrong. Yeah. And so medicine for me was a wonderful vocation, a calling. Mm. It allowed me to be a people pleaser. <laughs> it allowed me to care for others. You and I mentioned before you started recording that one of our greatest strengths as adults is learning how we serve others. Yeah. And I was profoundly affected by my ability to serve others. It made me feel okay. Yeah. Yeah. As, as a, as a people pleaser, because I know I came from the abuse, uh, family abuse and my, I was a situation where, uh, there was a major incident, a defining incident. And that defining incident, uh, caused me to, uh, react to my parents di in a different way. I, I hadn't spoken to my parents in years. I, I just shut down. Uh, and, um, that was one of my, um, I guess, uh, things that I had to deal with because I was in on campus in college and people have heard me talk about this before. I was on campus, doc, and walking to class. And the memory of that incident came rushing in to my thoughts. And um, here I was, this young man, and the overwhelming emotion that is attached with it, with that thought and that memory, became so overwhelming that I had to find a place to hide because I knew I was going to break down. And I'm on campus running, trying to find a place to manage this breakdown that I was about mm. to have because I knew it was coming on. And, um, but we, uh, because of this trauma, we make decisions and then we try to please people. But within that pleasing of people, we find that, um, you know, there's still this, am I good enough? It doesn't right. matter how many people you please. There is this, when the, when the curtain closes, if you will, from our busy day, and we are now in our uh, private space, those little thoughts began to dance around within us, and we began yeah. to deal with the truth. If you will, I like I like to talk about that concept of am I good enough <clears throat> to younger working mothers today? Yeah, and I'll tell you why. I knew I was a good enough doctor. I was a great doctor. I did a good job. I had good results. My patient families loved my care, and I still hear from kids who were in their twenties and thirties who were my patients. Um. I knew I did a great job of taking care of others professionally, but I had to convince myself over the 30 years, the last 30 years of my life, that I was a good enough mother. Hmm. I loved being a physician, and I loved having my three children. All three of them are different. They have beautiful, different strengths. They each have different weaknesses as well, and it was a struggle for me over the last 30 years to accept all the different problems that my children threw at me, which were all normal pediatric things. Hmm. If I couldn't get one child to the doctor when they were sick, I wasn't being a good enough mother. If I had to leave a sick child with a nanny instead of stay home with them myself, Self because I had patients to take care of. I wasn't a good enough mother. When my 16-year-old daughter developed an eating disorder, I figured it out before her pediatrician, and I got her the care she needed, and I cut my hours back so that I could take her to the therapist and the nutritionist, and I felt like a good enough mother because I was getting her the help she needed. 
but she had developed an eating disorder. And I thought that that meant I was not a good enough mother. And so there were so many instances throughout my motherhood tenure through which I had to convince myself that, yes, I was a good enough mother. I had a very fulfilling career. And when I was at home, I was all about my children, far more than about my husband. Bless his heart. He always was fourth on the list. You know, the first were the three (laughs) kids, then was the husband. And then I was way down at the bottom of my list trying to be the the perfect mother. And so what I am hearing young working mothers today struggling with is trying to be a perfect mother, which is impossible. And being satisfied with being a good enough mother, Hmm. having lived that life of never feeling like a good enough mother, if I yelled at my kids, oh, my God, I turned into my father. I didn't want to turn into my father. That wasn't being a good enough mother. So there are so many things we do as parents when we raise our children that Um, come from so deep inside of us, put there from our childhood Mm -hmm. by how we were raised. And the notion of being a good enough mother is so important these days because women are getting social media messages of perfectionism as parents. They're being programmed to think being a parent is something you can do perfectly and cur- yeah. in a curated way. And that is not the case, yeah. not the case at all. So my current level of activity is taking what I've learned about being a good enough mother and trying to share that with young women and young parents today who are struggling to balance career yes. and family life. It is a necessary gift that you have and i look at it as that because lots of families and young women um, the things that they do and they have to do and many uh, you have your single mom your single parents your single dad and so forth and then the uh, pressure of society the social media as you mentioned all the other pressures that Mm. are external that in many of our generation didn't have to deal with and I always say that perfection is the enemy of personal growth. It yes. stunts you. It keeps you in a perpetual circle. And um, if you don't know how to step off of that um, reoccurring nightmare that I call it of perfection, you can find yourself burnout. You can find yourself sick with diseases and all the other things that you will bring into your space because of this perpetual anxiety, all of those other things, Tom, that will be brought into your space because you're looking at all this, quote unquote, perfection, and you're seeing yourself imperfect. And then you begin to judge, you begin to do all those things that crushes the human spirit and cripples the mind. So here you are as a physician, you have your children and the dance uh, that is happening about the perfection and so forth. And you're, you're seeing aspects of uh, other families and so forth. I want to talk, spend a little time here because we, when we talk about these young families, let's talk a little about that because a lot of them are st- stuck there. They're in this nightmare relationship with themselves and they don't seem to know that there's a way out about and in self-accepting in this space. Now, talk to those young women, those mothers that are struggling with what you you dealt with and that perfection meant, am I a good enough mother? Mm-hmm. Talk to them as to how did you guide yourself? How did you encourage yourself right here? Because you have all the other entities telling them that they are less than. How did you manage right there in that world in your life? When I was 41, after the birth of my third child at age 40, I was pretty tired, (laughs) but healthy. 
we moved to a new city. My husband got a job that was fantastic for him, and my job was just okay. Too many hours. Um, I had a good enough nanny. The kids were all in private school, which cost too much money. (laughs) And basically, I was unhappy because my husband was so happy. And because my children had a good nanny and were in a good school, and because I lost control of my ability to work in a practice where I had to say so, I was new in the practice. And so there was a confluence of factors that loaded on me, and I became depressed, clinically depressed. I was able to work throughout all this time, but a friend of mine, another ICU doctor, said, boy, I think you're depressed. You know, I couldn't <laughs> sleep. I wasn't eating. I couldn't think straight. I was in a bad mood all the time. I was pessimistic. She recommended a therapist. I have an analogy that many working mothers will understand. <clears throat> I told my therapist that I imagined myself the man on the Ed Sullivan show, that's an old game, what is it, an old variety show on television. Yeah. There was a man who would go on the stage and he would spin sticks and put a plate on top of the stick. And he would create spinning plates on spinning sticks all over the stage. And he would run around and spin the sticks. And if any of the plates started wobbling, he would run over to them and spin it so that that plate would stay spinning nicely. And he had 15 or 20 plates spinning. And he was a crazy man running around the stage, spinning all of his plates uh, to keep everything perfect. And that was his act. Mm -hmm. And I said to my psychiatrist, I'm like the man spinning the plates. That's my life. Yeah. And he looked at me and he chuckled. My psychiatrist chuckled. He said, why don't you just take down some of the plates? (laughs) And I went, well, wow. (laughs) And so together, over the next 18 months, I made a list and I put all my plates on my list. (laughs) You know, I hadn't had a very good plate for me. I don't even know if I was up there. And I put myself on the list. Yeah. And I made choices. I made choices about which research project and which job uh, project and which child activity and which after school thing and my exercise and my spiritual growth and my friendship and my self care. And I had all of those things on a list and I made choices that helped me get healthy and stay healthy. And so I think the key to being a good enough mother is learning to take care of yourself, recognizing that you have all these plates spinning in the air, your job, your boss, your manager, your first child, your fifth child, your mother-in-law, your whatever, And then there's your plate that's just wobbling along. And if you don't spin the stick and work on your own plate, everything will come tumbling down. If you do not learn to take care of yourself, whether it's spiritually, physically, emotionally, talking to friends, having a support system, exercise, meditation, hobbies, I started playing the piano. I hadn't played the piano since I was a little girl. I relearned how music was so uplifting for my spirit. I started needlework. I learned how quiet and thoughtful and meditative needlework was. I would sit still and think about something other than my children being little kids and my busy work life. I also changed jobs a year and a half later. I was so unhappy with my work that I finally got brave enough to change jobs. And 
within another year and a half, my husband and I had decided to move to a city where we both had good jobs. And so working on my marriage was also an issue that I dealt with. First came taking care of myself. I was already taking good care of my kids. Second came taking care of my job, a bad one I got rid of and found Mm -hmm. a better one for me. And during that time, my husband and I worked on our marriage and decided we wanted to stay together and that would require relocation. And that is my very shortened story about how I learned how to take care of myself and be a good enough mother. You became a designer. And I tell people, (laughs) when we become a designer versus those that are just, um, for a lack of a better word, we are just drifting. Um, We are not, the decisions that we are are making in our lives seems as if they are already predetermined, Mm -hmm. meaning we get up in the morning, we drink the coffee, we get dressed, we run to work, and, and we are in this predetermined lifestyle. We drink on the weekends, we have a couple of things, we knock out Sunday night, we get up Sunday morning. And so this predetermined lifestyle, before we know it, we wake up, it's 30, 40 years. Uh-huh. But when we become a designer, Doc, like you or you talked about, it life became, becomes different at this space because I tell yes. people it becomes purposeful living. You yeah. then begin to change your trajectory by design. I choose. No longer are you within that perpetual movement with the wave that is coming back and forth. You are des- designing your life now. I yeah. choose to do this. I do this. And the very first thing that one must do when we are designing the life is deal with the self. You've yeah. got to, if you, loving the self and loving who you are, because I tell people, if you haven't started, you need to start quickly because yeah. you'll learn some <laughs> things about yourself. You'll learn how to forgive yourself. I was hard on myself. I was harder on, on me and everyone is on themselves than anyone else. And so I had to learn how to forgive my shortcomings, if you will. I had to learn how to be patient with me to give myself enough time to move to the next um, level of my uh, uh, perceive where where I should be. I had to learn all those beautiful, beautiful concepts. And then once I learned them, Doc, I can now practice it with other people. And so I tell people it is important that you learn to do that with yourself because as you learn to do that with yourself, you will then uh, do that with people and it will be a deeper relationship. You must learn to bring in the tools into your lifestyle to help you make those decisions. One of it, Dr. said, is meditation. The other said she went to counseling. The counseling, I love what you said about your (laughs) your therapist ask you, why why are you messing around, you know, about the plates? And why? Because he or she, and I tell people, go and find someone because they know the questions to ask you because you're so busy. Yeah. That you don't know to ask those questions. And when that question is asked and you are not rushing, it has a way of being deposited into you to cause the question as to, yeah, why am I doing this? And when you answer that question, that specific question right there, your life changes. Because then you will realize, wait a minute, I need to start designing my life. I need to make better decisions. And Donk said she incorporated meditation. She incorporated uh, piano playing music. She incorporated um, uh, uh, all of these other tools. And I tell people, Donk, the reason why you need those type tools is that it slows the thought life down. Yeah. It slows it down and it gives you a chance to decide. And that space right there is powerful. So here you are, Doc. You begin to decide. You've decided on you. You've decided on your marriage. You've decided on things. And you begin to make those purposeful decisions that will now enhance your life. 
talk to me was to once you move, because you now have to implement these things. You're now exactly. made the decision yeah. to do these things. <laughs> now you have to implement them. Talk to us about your implementation of these things that you have decided to do and how did they manifest? Because as growth is, it's not linear. It's all over right. the place. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so in the next phase of my life, after we moved to Austin, Texas, and we both had jobs we enjoyed, <clears throat> I joined a practice of nine men, mm -hmm. many of whom I knew in my training from Houston, Texas, and they were all full-time doctors married to stay-at-home moms, and I had a hard time filling up at work at seven in the morning. Mm -hmm. Not that I couldn't physically do that, but I would have to leave the house at 6.30, not see my children get ready for school and get on the school bus to make it to the hospital by 7. And so I was brave enough to say to my partners, I know you guys don't get this, but I would <laughs> like to feed my children breakfast and put them on the bus. Could we start our work day at 8? Instead yeah. of seven. And they said, well, we, 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 we've never done that before. I said, well, could we just try it? We tried it. Several of them came up and told me, I like that. I like seeing my kids at <laughs> breakfast before work. Uh, it's kind of fun. And I said, okay. And then when I had to do something at the school, uh, attend a play or, I don't know, visit go to a party or whatever mothers do at their children's elementary school. I said, hey, guys, if somebody could just cover for me a couple of hours, I've got to go to school. And they're looking at me like, what do you mean go to school? So I took this group of nine men mm -hmm. through their, wow, I really challenged their beliefs about how to run a medical practice and be family friendly. I became yeah. their little, okay, that's not very family friendly. And um, <laughs> afterwards, we hired three more women neonatologists wow. who loved the fact that our practice was so family friendly. Thanked mm -hmm. me very much. <laughs> so I did that. And I enjoyed that. And they became better fathers because of it. Maybe better husbands, too. Yeah. And I was loving my practice. And my children were all thriving. They were in public school, so it wasn't expensive like the private mm. school had been. And then I became just a tad bit bored with the regular ho-hum, taking care of sick preemies. And I wanted to do something different professionally. And I became, I volunteered to be medical director for a human donor milk bank in Austin. And I learned everything I could about donor milk banking. And then I started learning everything I could about breastfeeding medicine, which is part of neonatology, but it's almost a subspecialty now in itself. Yeah. And I fell in love with breastfeeding medicine, and I became a regional and later a national expert. I allowed myself professional development. I allowed myself, while practicing neonatology, to deviate just a tiny bit into another area. And I found that so rewarding. And I enjoyed the professional interactions that I had at meetings. My kids were older. Some of them traveled with me when I went to speak at meetings. And I was far happier as a physician. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I was still doing a little too much people pleasing, but <laughs> it was way more fun. And I had learned how to take care of myself physically and emotionally. Yeah. I never gave up time for exercise, time for meditation, time for hobbies, time for music. I never worked so many hours that I couldn't tend to the things that were important to my children. Yeah. And so what I did in that last half of my life was balance my professional um, aspirations with my 
maternal and marriage aspirations. Mm -hmm. And I think I became good at that balance for me. My children might say I still work too much. They might still say, Mom, you were really gone a lot. But Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably hard having physicians for parents because you know you're and the the mantra in our family was, oh, she's off taking care of a sick baby. So a child feels like, well, the sick baby's more important than me, and am I not important? And, you know, it's just, it's a big dilemma. However, children grow up fine without their mother being at home with them 24 hours a day. Working mothers raise perfectly happy children and perfectly successful children. And working mothers have a lot to teach their children about self-care, working with others, sharing, supporting others, um, how to have a good marriage and Balance. family. Balance. No. Um, balance. It's you have all to, balance. Yeah. Making guys, decisions. Yeah. Design, as you say, I like the term design because it is a form of designing to imagine what you want to be at work and to imagine how you want to be as a mother, as a parent, as a wife, Mm -hmm. or a husband. It is designing and making choices about your life. We have this one life, and this one life can touch. So many other people. Yeah. And so I, I opened by telling you that when I retired, I wrote a book and the book was the result of 18 months of self reflection. No, we're going to get there. I, I, oh, I, no, really <laughs> <laughs> I haven't forgotten a thing because I was going to bring you back there because life is okay. so wonderful. You're enjoying the kids. And then you started this thing talking about you burnt out. Right, I did. So uh, we're going to get to that aspect of of life because I think, I think personally, from all of my living on this on this planet, I've been here sixty one, and I and I like uh, the investigative part that the journey creates and um, asking perpetual questions and so forth. I was talking to my son today. I give you an example. And this show was talking about the serpent in the biblical monsters they were talking about. And they were talking about the serpent had legs. And that after they were doing all the research and so forth, and they found out that, yes, the ancestors, the older snakes, they had legs. And the, the whole focus was on the legs. And I'm like, but the snake was talking to her. <laughs> I'm like, you guys forgot that. To me, I'm like, hey, she, he's the snake is having a conversation. Forget the legs. I, I want to know, you know, who is he going to. Um, but, but it's just how we look at a situation, what is important. But life causes us to ask questions. And I think that there is a designer within our space, uh, an, un, an unannounced designer but the designer is there. And I believe because you internally was not there yet where you needed to be in order to discover deepness of you. And that designer, I believe, is us because I believe it's we're craving it. And we have this energy within us that um, the designer part, I think we're partnered with with God and, and we begin to shift. We are not happy because... There's something need something else needs to be dealt with, and I tell people when you're in that space, always welcome it because you're about to learn something new about yourself. You're about to go on a different journey. Don't panic. Don't begin to, um, you know, uh, bring in all the fear and all the other things. Begin with the questioning: Why am I here? And because Why? you weren't listening or paying that much attention, sometimes don't. I think you had to burn out in order for you to now begin to look deeper. Because if you were still busy, you wouldn't be able to look. You you are distracted, if you will. 
And I think as the distractions move away, that's when you and I began to look, as the, as I said earlier, the curtain is moved a little further out and we're looking in the, in the stage and going, wow, there's more to this play. So talk to us as you began to feel this shift and you burnt out. When you burnt out and you looked at yourself and you say, wait a minute, I'm here. What is it that needs to be discovered? And talk to us about that journey that you embark on. I was older and my kids were grown. And my husband and I had a stable marriage. Plenty of ups and downs, but stable. He was still working. I was looking forward to retirement. I was physically tired. Mm -hmm. I was emotionally tired. I kept working 50, sometimes 60 hours a week, if um, duty called. And that was a mistake for someone my age. Yeah. <clears throat> I allowed some very tender, very troubling ethical cases to get to me, to imagine, well, if I was that child's mother, what would I want? Yeah. That child had a mother who was making decisions. And um, there were two children that had ethically challenging cases at the time. <clears throat> and both parents made choices that I disagreed with. But it was the parents' choices. Mm -hmm. And as a physician, as a pediatrician, we respect the parents' choices. Let me ask you a question. Why, because you've been here before in the sense of these type decisions, and I'm sure you've seen them, why do you believe that these affected you? Because I know you said they were ethical. Was it ethical because it was against your opinion, or was it ethical health-wise, healthcare-wise? Both. I may have just lost my... Um AirPods connection. Can you hear me all right? Oh, I can hear you perfectly. Oh, good, good, good. Okay. It was in both ways troubling. It was something I disagreed with. Mm -hmm. And um, it, so it, 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 those things happen in medicine. As I look back on it, why those two cases? I had had cases like that throughout my entire life. Yeah, medical I know practice. you did. <laughs> I had I plenty of would. cases like that where the parents and the physicians might have disagreed. But I think it was on top of being tired, on top of yeah. being exhausted, on top of beginning to think about retirement. Um, my youngest child was going through a very difficult time in college. She was becoming symptomatic um, with anxiety, and she was abusing marijuana, and she was in college in Oregon, very far away from me, and I was worrying about her and worrying about these two patients, among all my others, and worrying about how was I going to keep working this tilt and when I was going to retire. And I think it was just emotionally overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I felt it at work. I might have felt it with my youngest daughter also, but I identified it with work burnout. Mm -hmm. Because when I went to a different location, a different practice location, when I lowered my hours, when I got back into therapy to examine the issues, all of them, my daughter, my marriage, my practice, those two babies, it really was everything all at once. It was not yeah. just those two babies. And I was able to rediscover how much I loved medicine. And I loved taking care of new moms and their babies. And I felt joy running to a delivery where I could do something to resuscitate a baby and I felt joy watching siblings visit. And I felt a lot of joy um, in my work, but a different kind of work, an easier kind of work. So I surmised that I had just allowed myself to professionally work too hard. Mm -hmm. 
those two cases were real, really a red flag that I had put too much emotional energy into my professional life. And maybe I had not taken care of myself enough. And then with my daughter, I was putting a ton of emotional energy into struggling to help her, which was not happening, and dealing with the fact that she was very far away and in someone else's hands and trying to make a go of it at school, doing something that I knew was harmful. Um, she was 20 and there was not much I could do about it. So yeah. I think that it was a confluence of all of those things at once that led to the burnout. But the feeling of no longer feeling fulfilled was so striking. It's the first time in my entire career that I had never felt like I was making a difference. Hmm. It's the first time in my career that I felt like I was not making a difference. And so recovering from that feeling was really important to me. And working part-time allowed me to do that. And therapy allowed me to recover from that. And then... I started writing a memoir, which mm -hmm. was the perfect way to recover <laughs> from that. <laughs> That's it one of allowed the two. me to go back through everything. Yeah. All the phases, all the stages, all the practices, all the partners, all the marital challenges. And each child had contributed um, challenges to me as a mother. And they were all doing well or getting the care that they needed and off working independently. And so by um, organizing my thoughts and by putting things on paper, I was able to make sense of my life, finally. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful when, that, when you have arrived at that space? Um, I feel, I remember mine. It was like the first time I could breathe. It was, you know, I remember going, and this deep breath, um, I let this deep breath when I looked at the, um, vastness of my decisions and, uh, as a whole and through all of its different manifestation in my life as a young man, single, as, as a dad, as a single dad, as, as a professional, all of it, when you look at the entirety that you have compiled so far, and when you bring it into a format that you can understand, um, there is a type of breathing that takes place there. I remember that day of, um, okay, let's, let's go. I was so excited uh, <laughs> that I got there because my life began to make sense because, yes. you know, uh, all of the craziness. And it is the dark times and the compilation of all of those things, the good times, the laugh, the pain. It makes us who we are and the beauty of us, that we are a vast, uh, deep reservoir of information, knowledge, um, discovery of the deepness of who we are. And as I learn and embark on that type of relationship, Don, I'm falling deeper in love with myself. Everything to me begins to happen different. Um, and I'm embarking on this new, I guess, journey. And one of the things that I mentioned at a previous podcast was my son said something to me and it, it created a response that I was not happy with. And I remember taking a few days to think of this whole situation. And I said to myself, I cannot allow anyone to cause me to react the way I just did. And I was, I looked at myself and I said, here you go, Ken, this is a beautiful opportunity that has presented. And so the declaration that I made within myself to now begin to rewire my mind and my belief and my thoughts is that I want to first, when someone comes in my space and speak to me, I want to see the greatness of that individual, the godness of them. I want to be able and place myself into a space of love where I am listening to them 
from this space of love, and that my words would be seasoned with the correct spices, if you will, that will help to make this conversation that we are having amongst ourselves with me and that individual fruitful, that it would not hurt them in any way. But it, I want to see the need, because sometimes they're speaking, but they're speaking out of pain. But if I respond in love, the love, it says, conquers all. And so my goal now and mission in life is to carry this until I die, because it'll make me even more beautiful to me. Because as I begin to see that I am capable of living that way, that to me is rewarding, that brings joy. And I don't know what it'll bring to that other person, but I know the journey is mine and what I'm seeking to gain as a result of this journey. So here you are, Tom. You got all the, the everybody, you brought them all to, to bat, and uh, you're looking at every aspect of your life. You got your uh, memoir, you put this down, and now you figured out your life. What did you figure out? <laughs> I figured out that I was and am a good person. I mm. have great value. I have many strengths. I have some weaknesses. I had a wonderful career. I was a good enough mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good wife. I have good friends. Not a lot, but the few friends that I have are really good friends. Yeah. I uh, enjoy talking to younger women about my struggles in an effort to help them through what I know they must be dealing with. Yeah. It is so common for young working women, probably young working parents, to struggle with these issues. No matter what your profession, no matter the ages of your children, we all want to do a good job in our work and in our personal lives. And I feel like I finally understand myself enough to help other people in that aspect. And I'm not practicing medicine. Maybe I'm practicing pseudo-psychology. <laughs> <laughs> My psychiatrist wouldn't like that term. But, but uh, I'm practicing being supportive. Being a servant. Being though. loving. As, being as servant. you say, being loving. It's being yes. loving. It's loving other people. It's supporting others who you know are going through life. This is life. You can now comfort them with the principle, or you can now comfort them with the comfort that you have received. All of it, the spiritual aspect, the spiritual comfort, the professional comfort, the entirety of you. You are now in a space by which you can gift you to others and your knowledge, your insights, your um, as you said, the pseudo uh, <laughs> psychologist, and <laughs> you are able and capable of asking the questions that they are not able to ask, that you can say to them, why not take some of those plates off? And because they are so busy within the framework of living and working and being a provider and all the other things that are um, part of the uh, motherhood and single families and so forth that many times don't they get home and they're a little exhausted and they don't have the time to engage but being in your space where you can recognize where they are you would know the question to ask to elicit the response that will free them from where they're at because you are familiar with that particular space because you've been there before. Uh, everyone that has been listening to this conversation, especially those that are young um, uh, mothers and families that Donk is talking about, she has a heart for that. You can sense it. And I call on you to get in touch with her, buy her book, her memoirs, as she puts it. I'm sure it houses information as to how to guide oneself right where you are. But I want you guys to buy it up and 
handed to people, single parents, moms, and young families, bring in it into her space, get to her space so that she can be that pseudo encouragement <laughs> <She's> <laughs> to, and help you to get to where you need to be because there's freedom there. And she has the heart to help along with the wisdom that she gained the experience so that she can offer you this beautiful tasting dish that is called her life. And you guys can partake and uh, grow and be nourished. Doc, thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. You are so very welcome. I have really enjoyed talking with you. This I am has so been glad. <laughs> So um, I know we haven't finished yet. I have this question that that I want to ask you because some of those young families are going to realize this, and and I had to because I had four. Uh, I was a single dad, and and um, I have five sons, but four was living with me at the time. And as you mentioned, they're all different, different personalities, different stages of development, and so forth. That it in itself becomes a challenge to be able to manage uh, manage that those relationships. And um, I want you to take a couple of minutes. I know we had closed it up. I just I feel uh, impressed to ask this question here about the children and how to. I I called it, um, and I have a terminology for it. Uh, 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 I call uh, compassionate detachment. And it is a very valuable lesson that I had to learn with my children. I had to learn how to be compassionate, but yet detached in a way to protect self, but yet to be able to be in a space where I could be beneficial to them. Talk to us about your understanding of your relationship with your children. In the fact, you mentioned your daughter where she was 20, she was doing her own thing. How did you have to manage, uh, manage that relationship because some of those young families are in these type situations? Compassionate detachment is one of the most difficult things to learn in As life. As a parent. <laughs> As a parent. We do not like to detach from our children. Trust me, I know. But when our children are older teenagers and young adults, we cannot yeah. control them. And it is the hardest lesson in life. They have learned from us so much, but they are their own person. Yeah. They make their own choices, and they commonly make choices we do not agree with. <laughs> <laughs> And in so doing, we feel compelled to help them. Yes. But helping them is not what independent young adults need. Yes. They need to be allowed to make their own choices, to suffer their own consequences, yeah. to make their own decisions, to go their own way, to be different from us. And that is one of the hardest lessons a parent learns, in my view. It's far easier to parent infants and young children <laughs> and school-aged children, far, far easier. They still look to you for everything. Yeah. Parenting young adults uh, requires that we compassionately detach yeah. We give them advice when they ask for it. Mm -hmm. We're happy with who they become. If they need professional help, we try to pay for it. I paid for, <laughs> I paid for my daughter's psychotherapy when she developed yeah. severe anxiety. And uh, most recently, I paid for her rehabilitation services yeah. to get her off of marijuana which she yeah. was abusing. So compassionate detachment doesn't mean we do nothing for yes. or with our adult children or our teenage kids. It means we make those choices with great deliberation. Yeah. How can we best help? Yeah. How can we 
guide in a way that's not forcing them because they are their own people. It is the hardest phase of parenting that exists, in my view, parenting okay. adult children. Yeah. Um, I don't know if your listeners are old enough to have adult children, but you will be one day. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> isn't the hardest lesson that Ken has talked about? Compassionate detachment. It is a tough nut to crack. Yeah. And the sooner you crack it, the happier you'll be as a parent and as a grandparent. Yes, I agree. I, I wanted to stop there and talk to that because I feel some people, someone needs to hear that information. It is the single most difficult um learning part as you said uh, for a parent especially one who has been like yourself and like myself people pleasers and so we're always there <laughs> it's the biggest lesson and so but it is a valuable one it is to allow the child the individual to grow and um as we allow them to grow the decision is what's best for them to um, to manage that relationship so it's not they don't turn on you and become your enemy if you will but you're able to still be there and still allow them to be an individual again Don, thank you so much for coming to Fresh of Enlightenment this has been beautiful thank you so much oh you're welcome you're welcome I'm so glad to have met you and spent 